Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome our, our next speaker onto the stage now. We've got uh, Jesse Martin, who's going to be uh, talking about uh, thinking in graphs. We all love a little bit of graphs. Here is. Hi, Jesse, how are you? That's good. And it's, it's Jesse, but it's totally Hi. understandable because I, I get it a lot. I live in Germany. <laughs> exactly. I went for more the European uh, style. Sorry about that. <laughs> conference uh, fine. all right i see you got your slides already running there it's looking very fancy so i'll leave you to it have a good one all right thank you so let me switch modes here into the uh highlight mode here so uh hello everybody and thank you for coming to this talk today i am going to be giving a high level overview about graph thinking and this is coming from the context of my experience working with a content management system called Graph CMS. That's where I work. And we have seen basically companies embrace or try to convert their, their content structures into graph supported structures. And this is just some of the insights that I've gleaned from that. This is a much more high level talk than probably the majority. But we're going to go ahead and, and just uh, jump right in. Let me start my timer so that I can make sure that I'm keeping everybody on track today. So anyways, we'll start with the thinking in graphs. This is high level, uh, a high level architectural overview of content federation. So what we're going to learn today, we're going to learn three benefits of graph structures. We're going to learn graphs in content structures. And we're going to learn about federation as natural groupings of nodes. And then we're going to look at three rules to determine uh, graph separation. What we're not going to actually be learning today is API-specific technology for graphs. And we're not going to learn why GraphQL is uh, dominantly better for graphs than REST. OK, I just had to do that because we're a GraphQL company. Um, I'm not actually wanting to start a flame war. But anyways, that's my, my joke for today uh, about me. So my name is uh, Jess Martin. You can find me on Twitter at Motley Dev, and I do work for Graph CMS, a GraphQL only uh, headless content management system, which we'll mention a little bit later on in the talk, but you can find more about that later. Side note on GraphQL, I'll be running the GraphQL track uh, next uh, tomorrow, which is basically all day, and I would love to see as many of you there as possible. Okay, so uh, why, why prototyping with graphs? Uh, so, I'm going to quote Leonardo da Vinci, and if I'm quoting Leonardo da Vinci at an early stage of a of a API conference talk, then that'll give you kind of a feeling for where we're actually going to be going with this today. Uh, but Leonardo da Vinci, learn how to see, realize everything is connected to everything else, and that is basically the fundamental concept behind graph thinking. So let's start with a little bit of a graphs primer here, and we're just going to have a quick look at some uh, basic concepts or truths about graphs, and then we're going to abstract those out into applying it to our content model. Okay, so first up, what we have is uh, definitions. So graphs are a combination of these nodes, and they're connected together by these edges that we attach uh, the nodes together. So these edges have usually some kind of a, a meaning or a relationship defined. We'll cover that here in one second. And what else is interesting about uh, graphs is that they actually have properties. So graphs can be directed, which in, implies sort of a uh, hierarchical relationship in our content. They can also be uh, uh, unordered. And so they can be just connected as sort of a free floating organism of ind independently connected pieces. And that's one of the interesting elements uh, about graphs is these properties of direction or no direction, but they all add meaning to the graph that we're trying to create. And then the uh, next point is some characteristics. So our graph can actually be centralized. The more attachments that a node has or more edges going to a node, we can sort of attach a, a semantic meaning to that saying that, okay, this is now centralized around this hub of our node. And this is referred to as a centralized, uh, centralized graph. Okay, and the last thing is it can be multiplexed. So we have sort of this idea of a bunch of tightly grouped nodes together, and they all have their interdependencies, and then we can sort of branch out to other graphs, and that's the idea that you have sort of this uh, multiplexed graph. 
All right, so that's the really very fast primer of, of graph, uh, graph theory, if you will, or, or graph structures. Uh, but what we're gonna have here is the three benefits that I'm abstracting from that about graphs that we're gonna look at in context of content modeling. So the three benefits that I'd like to highlight here, the first one is going to be uh, basically that there's a very flexible semantic uh, behind the way we can structure our graphs. These edges can actually uh, gain these sort of independent values. And if we look at that, we'll see, uh, you know, from this person to the company, it's an employee to employer, from the house to the person, it's occupant to resident, uh, from the car to the house, vehicle, park location. These edges have semantic meaning that we're able to use uh, and be able to, to define qualities in the actual graph structure that we have. And moving on to the second uh, main benefit that I think is really interesting about graphs is they have these observable thresholds. And what that means is that if we actually look at how the content connects together, the more nodes that we attach to these graphs is we'll see these patterns start to flow. So even if we were blind to the actual uh, value of the node itself, we can sort of see the way that this uh, these nodes kind of connect or flow into the other nodes. They actually oftentimes refer to this as, as sort of the flow of a river or uh, or percolation sometimes they refer to it as as well. And that's we can see that okay now that we've added more employees uh, in theory in this content model, they've sort of made this streamline uh, behavior moving towards the individual uh, building where they all work or potentially all to some sort of a manager person. Uh, so it's an interesting behavior as well as that we're able to actually observe uh, this, uh, this uh, behavior. And the next one is, is that we want to see is the network effect. And the network effect of graphs is that the more nodes that you add, uh, the, the theory of a network of the network effect is that the value of a network is the square of the total nodes. And this is exactly what most of the social networks are based off of. This is why a lot of companies uh, work really quickly to try and hit that critical mass point, because the more nodes that you get inside of the graph, the more inherent value there is. So these are some of the three sort of core concepts behind the uh, graph, like graph benefits. And we're going to go ahead and look at how these values then actually apply. So the three benefits of graphs for our content when we start to structure our content uh, in graph, graph type structures or relationships. Okay, so what do we have here? Uh, first one up is if we look at the flexible semantics, what we get is the ability to very tightly couple the mapping of our content to our business domain. So if you're trying to shoehorn your content model into some other company's idea of, of a database structure or something else, you're going to start to find some limitations where you're having to teach internal uh, resources. All right, well, this is called um, X, but in our system, it's actually these things over here. But with a graph kind of structure, when you abstract away any of the underlying database technologies and really think about your content in a graph, able to truly map what it is that your business domain is actually trying to represent and it creates faster onboarding it creates better organization and there's a couple of other benefits that we're going to look at uh, on the next slide so the second benefit as applied to uh, uh, content is when we look at the actual observable thresholds again is that we're actually able to start to see then some patterns that potentially reveal a new uh, business opportunity for our content, uh, our content database. So maybe it's not just about connecting employees to a business or being able to understand sort of uh, what works, but if we actually look at the flow of this data and the flow of relationships, we potentially can automatically map out a uh, business org and be able to say, okay, this is actually the managers and uh, it starts to reveal some interesting parts about our data where we could say we're no longer just simply a contact book for your company. We're now a, a org planning or we're an org diagram system for your company to be able to, to map who's doing what. And that's where leading to sort of the, the third point, which I find really interesting about uh, graph structures applied to content 
And then it's very specifically, when you look at network effects. And so the network effects, the more nodes that you add, it creates an ability to have this very succinct searching because the, the dynamicism of your data becomes really, um, it allows you to be really literate with how you're trying to query for something. So if you have a structure like this where you've observed how many nodes you have connected and you have these sort of uh, built-in patterns, we can start with a question, something like, uh, show me employees with zero direct managers. That's an important business question to be surfacing. And if we're using a graph structure, it allows us to map these sort of intentions or these requests to that graph type structure. And so that's something that's the third benefit of uh, graphs for, for content um, where we can really see this new value added. We can see uh, the ability to search better and we can potentially get uh, new business opportunities out of that. Okay, so moving on down then the chain, what we're gonna to switch to is uh, managing the graphs, right? So uh, the previous talk kind of touched on this a little bit, but the fact is, is that what we're looking at in the world around us is essentially um, a, a organized chaos of independently floating nodes, some directed, some, uh, some uh, non-directed graphs. And what we're trying to do is find a way to actually manage these these graph of graphs together, because there are a lot of these interdependent uh, pieces where potentially if we're looking at sort of an e-commerce model here, uh, what we're potentially looking at is our shipping and our inventory tracking should somehow be connected to uh, our warehousing and our user management and our currency or, or payments. So all of these pieces potentially belong together, but it would be a madhouse to try to actually put them all together. And so what we're gonna try and uh, see here is sort of how do we make sense out of this sort of a structure? Okay, so the first item we're gonna look at here is uh, the, the multiplex graphs, graph networks needing a manager. So all of these different graphs, these, these independent graphs connected together as we referred to at the beginning from our terminology, it's, it's a multiplex graph, uh, but multiplex graphs need a manager and they also need uh, a better, a better name <laughs> because that's just a ridiculous thing to try and refer to is referring to your multiplex uh, graphs for your content system. And we do have a proposal for a new name to how we can describe this in terms of our content management. And what we like to refer to it as a graph CMS is this idea of what we call um, the content federation. And if you look at the definition of federation, it's, it's combining multiple independent organisms underneath a singular branch that's able to sort of direct control, have oversight, while still allowing the independent states to operate uh, freely and, and leverage the benefits of, of the agile and micro workflows that have developed organically inside of that graph yet still having a system to be able to have an oversight over all of these independent pieces. So that's, that's great. That's, I think, something everybody could agree to, but that's probably going to be a little bit easier said than done. And to sort of address that, I want to talk about some principles for being able to break out, the, um, break out our graphs into subgraphs, which I refer to as the co-location versus federation. And this will allow us to sort of have three rules to divide by and figure out what should live in its own graph, what should come into sort of a singular graph, and we'll look at how this can kind of break down. Okay, moving on to the next point here. So what we have here is, uh, the first one is organizational oversight. I had to shorten that down to org because I just couldn't get it on the, on the slide. And let's take these sort of independent pieces here. We could imagine sort of business analytics on the left, uh, a payment provider in the, in the second step, sort of our social management, uh, social engagement on the third, and then shipping inventory, warehousing, something there on the last category. These are abstractions. Uh, we're gonna look at sort of how these break down then. So uh, in the first case, these are like isolated independent business units. If you have an independent business unit with an oversight that's saying, okay, uh, this entire team operates independently of everybody else, and they have their own needs, their own deadlines, their own uh, you know, responsibilities, that could be one way to say that their content graph belongs in isolation from everybody else with then an exposed interface to the other graphs in our system. 
A second example could be uh, microservices or, or, or um, software as a service. So actually an external provider, maybe this is Stripe or some other provide, uh, payment provider where you, you actually don't even have the oversight uh, or the ability to, to impact how that's being operated. And so you either need to create a wrapper around that as a sort of a sub team, or you're just directing, uh, directly interfacing with their, uh, with their graph. And maybe it's a really impersistent source. So it's something where the content is really ethereal and it's something that's just the, the whole scale of it is something where you're more just, you know, reaching into the waterfall and pulling out a little piece of content as it goes by and you're not actually being able to really depend on the shape or the eventuality or anything else about the content source. It's something you're wanting to kind of feed into your, to enhance your graph uh, understanding, but it's not something you could have any sort of uh, static uh, dependency on. And then the last piece is a highly specialized domain. It could be that there's actually a lot of very uh, dynamic pieces that are either archaic or there are a lot of legacy structures in place and you just need them to continue to operate <laughs> because the, the boat is somewhere between here and China and you just have to kind of trust that it's going to arrive at a harbor at some point. Okay, so if we look at then the, those are sort of organizational uh, differences. Let's look at what it would actually be if we talk about uh, edge association. So a lot of these sub elements kind of uh, form naturally between each other. So our, our analytics team, they're the data source for all of our user analytics and our dashboarding and everything else sort of lives together in a lot of overlap. So these are what we refer to as strong ties, a lot of natural edges between the different pieces. But then maybe the, the really you know, thin connection we have to a singular source from our analytics team would be our inventory, but that's then going to be a weak tie because this is just like one or two simple edges that we have between these two data sources. So looking at the actual amount of edge association between our content graphs will help us be able to determine a little bit as well. Should this be something that we try to maintain in a singular graph or should this be something that we try to orchestrate as part of a larger graph? And then we have the uh, third rule and that's going to be uh, stack different differentiation. Uh, that's my little Apple pun for, for the day. Uh, but what we have is basically looking at the technologies uh, lying underneath these independent units as well. So, uh, you know, the analytics team talking large volume storage, hide, read, write operations, uh, strong aggregation requirements, firewall access access. So a lot of the, you know, unique business requirements around the data storage and the access uh, con controls there. And then on our shipping inventory, uh, low volume storage, uh, but long, long lasting, uh, sparse write operations, minimal aggregation need, and potentially extremely unstable access could be something that it's, you know, as soon as literally that boat in between here in China, when it comes into some sort of a a signal zone and be able to actually connect online. Very different needs in terms of access control management. And this is something else for us to sort of have a uh, high level overview to determine uh, if it makes sense to co-mingle these two technology sources, which are highly, highly differentiated uh, or say, okay, they also belong in sort of their own, their own graphs just because of the underlying technologies and the teams have specialized in building those toolings out. So if you have all these independent graphs, then you need to still find a way to say, okay, how do we actually orchestrate these pieces together? Because at the end of the day, the idea of a, feder of a content federation really is that we can take advantage of the agile content development, we can take advantage of all these, uh, the, the powerful features of our content sort of growing in isolation of each other, but we still want to have an ability to orchestrate it together. And so I'm just going to show a really simple example here of, of a uh, simple UI component and how that kind of worked out at GraphCMS and an example that we built. Uh, so you have here sort of a standard uh, wine product card, if you will. Um, happens to be one of my favorite wines as well. For, I'm American, so it's California wine. Uh, no offense to anybody here at, the, at API Days Paris. I'm, I'm preaching to the French here. Uh, but if we look at how this content breaks down, we have sort of a unified customer experience 
But at the end of the day, we actually have two different time to live content types, right? So we have uh, statically develop, uh, generated content, the image, the descriptions, the vineyard, country of origin, uh, tasting notes. But then we have a highly dynamic content pieces. So aggregation of our actual values, uh, the, the reviews itself, is it available or not available? Uh, even the current pricing conditions. So we have, we have two different types. And beyond even that, we actually have another uh, content problem here. And that is that there's actually uh, different content sources. So the pink actually is coming directly from Graph CMS content model. Uh, and we see the, the blue here is actually coming from a company called Hazura, where we have authenticated access. And then the green is coming from Commerce Layer, which is my inventory, inventory and pricing manager. So all of these pieces are actually needing to come together into a singular experience. But if I'm a singular developer, that's actually going to be a lot of, uh, of overhead to manage the different timings and everything else behind that. Well, at GraphCMS, our solution to the content federation problem is what we refer to as remote fields, where you can define these individual fields on your content model that will resolve data at any external API that you've connected. And what you have then is the ability to, to extend the type safety system that you have with GraphQL inherently, and you have the ability to, to now ship a single API to your customer. So if you're not familiar with GraphQL, this is not a GraphQL talk, there will be a track for that tomorrow. But let's have a, just a quick look at what that query behind this literally looks like. This is the query running the actual content model here. And if we look at the different pieces here, what we have is Graph CMS is shipping the entire content payload, but then I've got a snippet out of there that is coming from my inventory tracker. And we have the piece that's coming from the actual uh, review management system. And both of those are now in a singular interface where I can actually access this and ship this to my development teams where my business intelligence team connected the pieces together and I now have access. This is a really powerful paradigm for developers. I'm just about out of time here, so I don't have a whole lot more time to actually uh, to elaborate on this too much more. Uh, but it's a, the concept of stitching these pieces together is extremely powerful to federate your graph so that my inventory tracking can develop in isolation. My, my review management system can, de can uh, develop in isolation. My content team can make those beautiful descriptions and titles about my wine in isolation, but yet I can still access all of that from my development team. And that's a really powerful, uh, powerful primitive to work with today. Um, other companies to have a look at, the Guild uh, doing stuff with Mesh, the previous speaker also talking about Mesh technologies. Uh, Mesh and Federation are often kind of using similar concepts. Federation's a bit more intentional as to why um, but it's the, but the technology underlying it can be stitching, can be federation, can be meshing. Uh, that's the idea of leveraging the benefits of all of those together. So that's it for my talk. That was a whirlwind. <laughs> uh, I think there's some time for some questions perhaps, and, uh, I'll have, uh, Alan back on stage here. Hey, Jesse, thank you very much. That was very, uh, very enlightening, uh, whirlwind, but uh, a lot of information, but it's all, all good. All good. Um, I, I would have, you know, I think we've got time for maybe one question. So, so my, my question is, if, if organizations are themselves looking, you know, GraphQL and, and how ex they can expose that to their, you know, internal, external consumers. Um, we, we've been looking a lot at REST APIs and how we can productize and monetize those APIs. So, you know, for example, number of API calls, et cetera. Uh, have you seen any, any kind of examples of productization, monetization from GraphQL? Um, yeah, uh, we have seen a few companies uh, start to get into that space where they're looking at the amount of nesting. So with GraphQL, one of the one of the hallmarks of it is you can you can join through one query a lot of a lot of nested pieces. So you don't have the round trip, but you still have in the back end essentially the same database operations where you're having to fetch different tables together. And yeah. so nested data is one area where people are starting to abstract a monetary value to say free tier you're allowed you know nesting of maybe two levels uh but then pro tier gold you're able to nest four or five levels because that's one of the things about a graph structure as you can mm. see i'm going there and back and there and back as many times as you want because the interface is not necessarily building in an inherent uh limitation if you're 
if your tool's not sort of said, hey, you already have this data, stop asking for it. Right. All right, got it. Hey, that was fantastic. Uh, gonna let you go now, uh, but uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you.